Welcome, everybody, to the Path to Understanding podcast. We're so happy to have you join us tonight for this conversation of sharing some wisdom from our neighborhood. Tonight, we'll be talking with uh, Pastor Paul Benz from the Faith Action Network about the legislative uh, session that's, uh, that's happening right now in Olympia, Washington, and learn about some of the priorities that they are working with uh, with the legislature. I want you all to know that, uh, that we at Pass to Understanding recognize that we're living on, uh, almost all of us, uh, on the land of the Coast Salish peoples, and we honor those people, their ancestors, and this land. And we're, we're grateful for our partnership with them. Um, Paul, whose land are you on uh, right now? Do you know? Well, um, uh, complicated sometimes. It, well, no, not really. It, it 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 depends upon where I'm at, right? Uh, where I'm where I'm sitting right now, um, in South Snohomish County, would be uh, the Snohomish, mm -hmm. and a lot of people in Snohomish County know the town of Snohomish. But they don't necessarily know that there was actually a tribe, I, yeah. what I call a historic treaty tribe, called the yeah. Snohomish. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't, um, and you and I could have a lot of banter back and forth about the, um, the very tragic treaty system yes. that created the modern day tree, uh, tribes that we have. And it's not that, that those are new creations, but they were, they were an, a quote, evolution of Indian country. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a, a, a bill that we're working on in terms of um, uh, of our school system, our K through 12 mm -hmm. school system, are uh, requiring them to learn more. It, it's a, been an iteration of a bill that Senator McCoy introduced uh, a few years ago to, uh, called Time and Memorial. But this puts a date on it, puts further mandates on public schools to actually incorporate it into their social studies program. But the um, uh, the Colville tribe testified on it. And he said, he, he, he said the same thing that, that what I'm trying to say right now is, look, you got to go, you, you have got to make sure in this, in this curriculum that you go back before the treaties came into being in, in from, you know, 1850 to, to whenever, 1880, even 1830, yes, yes. If you go further east in our country. But um, that it looks a whole lot different in terms of, 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 of the tribal system. And, and that if we wanna really have our kids, yes, it's very important to learn about the Tulalip um, tribe. But the Tulalip tribe was created out of the Point Elliott Treaty. And who are, who are, the, uh, are the tribes on that treaty? Well, yes. if you look, yeah. and it doesn't take much to get a dig it out and look, there's the Snohomish, there's the Duwamish, uh, but they didn't get federally recognized. And the question is, well, you know, how come? Anyway. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. I mean, I know that in, in Anacortes here, a, a beautiful mural was, was put together, kind of a, a historic art piece um, about, the, about the development of, of Anacortes. And uh, it's, like th it's like the universe was created somewhere around 1870 or so. <laughs> and that's just really, really sad. So you can all tell that, that Paul Benz is... Uh, is really committed to to justice work in this country by just by this conversation and and of course Paul I just want to also say that there are many other tribes that were not recognized either and and we really need to to work to stand with our indigenous sisters and brothers about that. Um, but Paul's an ordained minister of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the same church that I'm part of. He served as the director of the Lutheran Public Policy Office of Washington, previous to his role at the Faith Action Network. Paul's been a longtime social justice leader in Washington State's religious community on numerous issues, and he continues to advocate for FAN's legislative agenda in Olympia. So, Paul, for those who don't know, could you briefly describe what the Faith Action Network does? Sure. Thanks, Terry. Um, Faith Action Network came into being about uh, 10 years ago, and out of, a, out of a, a merging and coming together of Lutheran Public Policy Office and the Washington Association of Churches, which at that time was was the ecumenical state body. And I think there was a, there was a, a, a vision to say, you know, this is uh, to use the, the, the religious term, the biblical term, Kairo, this is a Kairos moment, right? Not a, just a chronological moment, but a Kairos moment in terms of let's put our feet into the interfaith waters, so to speak, right? And, um, um, and uh, take a swim in those waters and, and live what we really see as the family of God. And, and to join those voices then together 
um, in the halls of power uh, for justice, for social change, the change that many of us want to see. Um, so uh, FAN is made out of two networks, a network of advocating faith communities. Uh, we, have, we have close to 160 right now around the state, but basically out of conversation with uh, FAN leadership has said that yes, the, the, the common link between these 160 is that a part of our mission, a part of our purpose is to advocate for justice in the halls of power. And by a hall of power, just so our listeners know, hall of power, I mean like it could be uh, the city of Everett, the, the city council or Anacorta city council or the yeah. Washington state legislature where most of fans work is done or of course in the other Washington uh, in, in Congress. So um, anyway, that's, uh, and the other network is, is the Terry Kylos, the Ian Olsons, the Paul Benzes, whomever it is, right? They make up the individual member <laughs> network. And those are the ones that actually do the advocating. It's those voices we, we bring together. But we wanna make sure that the faith communities of which most of these members are a part of also uh, are, are, are a part of this. So, yeah. Thank you, Paul. And, and uh, you know, to that point, uh, um, you know, what, I'm gonna kind of flip some things around here. How, what role do those faith communities have um, and how are they received by legislators? I mean, is there any additional weight that comes with being part of a faith community? What I, what I like to call a wisdom or a community of wisdom, right, right, because right. not all of our, of our traditions, uh, the word faith is understood the same way, you know? Right, so, right, right. So, yeah. so how are folk received when they, when they show up in the offices there and does that carry a, a lasting weight? Well, I, I think so to a certain degree, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're dealing with elected officials, politicians, and, yes. and, and uh, we have a lot of, I'm, I'm very serious about this, we have a lot of very dedicated public servants. I know we have great division in this country, but who really appreciate the, uh, the faith voice. Um, <clears throat> um, and also they appreciate, I think, the combined faith voice. So you're exactly right, Terry, that and that was, that was the part of the vision that I was carrying into help bringing FAN in, into being in that, right, you and I go in as Lutheran ministers and whomever else we, we bring in, in terms of the, the Lutheran club, so to speak, the, the Lutheran denomination. And that's all well and good. And maybe the elected official you're talking to, you know, might happen to be a Lutheran or whatever. But I think when you, no matter who the elected official is in terms of their faith background, when you can bring in an interfaith delegation, uh, even of two or three, or even myself as the, as the quote, you know, interfaith lobbyist, uh, that mm -hmm. I'm representing a larger network that has multiple voices in it, that does, it, it, it does make a difference. So one of the, the questions that you just kind of implied there a second ago was, you know, that there's this larger national political environment and I guess I'm I'm wondering, you know, how that's impacting the poli the policy discussions in the Washington State le Legislature. How much is that impacting? Yeah, uh, yeah. those conversations. Yeah, and and of course we know that the the situation you you describe um, has obviously heightened in ways that I don't think anybody wants to see. But that situation has been around, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, quite some time. It has impacted Olympia because um, Olympia, Washington State, is a part of the uh, of the of the nation, and a part of the of the divisions we have. We have the same divisions here in Washington State that the country has, right? No matter how you want to describe those those divisions, economic, racial, cultural, religious. Um, but I would say I would say this that also in Olympia, the state legislature. Um, which is the body that I deal with the most, um, has been, I think, on the most part, much more civil in terms mm -hmm. of its floor debates. It, it can be, let me tell you, it, the, the, the public doesn't tune in, obviously, um, and maybe uh, better, uh, better that, that they don't, but they're, they're obviously, and the public knows that, there are some very bitter, bitter debates that go on in the floor of the Washington State Senate and the House. But, there is also a great degree of collegiality between the mm. audience. And uh, I, I know the minority leader, Representative J.T. Wilcox, and I know his heart. And I also know the heart of uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Lori Jenkins. 
And it's not that they sit there uh, in their daily jobs and see what bombs they can throw each other. Um, mm -hmm. Are some, some of the members of their caucuses thinking about that? That's, mm -hmm. that's the political battle that we're, that we're currently in in this country and in the state. But I, I do have to say that there is a great deal of civility as well. I'm so glad to hear that. I mean, we all know that politics is you know, partly drama. You know, part of it's debate, but part of it's drama. And, uh, and we do, we have had this, you know, through social media and the web and, and I think uh, many other forces in this country, this sort of, um, it's, it's like the, the, the popular, the, the conversation that we have is, is like on a piece of toffee that's being pulled out toward the edge, you know, a lot of times. Uh, but it's really great to know that, that there are, that there are folks there trying to keep the conversation civil and not allow all the conversation to get to a point where we have to call each other evil, because isn't that kind of what we saw on, on January 6th at the, at the Capitol building that we saw really about 40 years worth of talk radio and then the web and then TV and then social media essentially declaring that people who disagree, particularly if, if they disagree with conservatives, are, are evil, are not American, are not patriotic, potentially communist or, or some kind of problem and uh, so, some kind of threat. And that we know that that kind of dehumanization always leads to violence. And that's what we had, you know, in part uh, on, on, on the 6th. And I, I, I really hope that, that we can lessen that in our state legislatures you know, around, around the country, especially here. Yep, yep. No, I think, uh, I think our state legislatures do have a bit more civility built into them because it, 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 it comes more local. I'm not saying that there's not great division. There is, but um, yeah. I mean, just just today there was great debate on on uh, uh, putting restrictions on the open carry of guns in public places, particularly in the Capitol. Yeah, and uh, you can imagine the 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 pro con debate that was going on. Of course, uh, and and I can understand some of that uh, that conversation. At the same time, we know that there's been demonstrations, and uh, there's been people uh, getting onto the governor's mansion a uh, property and and some some threats down there um, that make it rather difficult for legislators to feel safe and so it's it really is a conversation uh, that that's very difficult um, uh, th so this is the year for the biennial, biennial budget to be developed um, and uh, I guess I'm just wondering Paul I know we talked last spring about how covid was, impacting the state budget and the revenues of the state. Um, how has COVID impacted those revenues uh, for the state, for counties and cities? Like, can you give me, give, can you give us a sense of that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, six months ago, um, say last summer, um, our, and we have about a 52, 53 billion two-year budget, biennial budget. Mm -hmm. um, the deficit back in June which was really the peak of our of our deficit was about nine billion in the hole, and um, due to various factors, um, uh, we have been able to, uh, and and some of that was was federal relief, uh, but other was other sources of re revenue that were still uh, percolating in our state, and we uh, came into the legislative session this month about uh, two three weeks ago, at sitting at about three billion between two and three billion uh, deficit. And fortunately, uh, some of the civility uh, and leadership, if I could also term it like that, uh, a few years ago in our state said, let's develop um, a rainy day fund. The formal title is Budget Stabilization Act. And there is a, there is a funding formula for which funds flow into that on, a, on an annual basis. Um, so, and that's been built up to about that same amount. So the, the legislature will use probably a lot of that, maybe all of it, um, because the legacy of COVID, and we are still in it. Um, <laughs> and so we got to get through it, first of all, just economically speaking. Yes. And then there's going to be what I just simply call the, the, the legacy. The, you know, once we begin to get out of it, just economically, doesn't mean that, that, that things are just going to uh, come back to normal. Yeah, just in yeah. terms of the economy again. So uh, the legislature is preparing for that. And there, there are several revenue packages 
uh, that will be on the table uh, because they don't want to go back to the austerity mode of, of cutting programs because we know what happens then. It's usually the health and human service programs that get cut. And mm -hmm. we also know that in COVID, in, in difficult times, everything changes, but nothing changes. And what nothing has changed is that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the case in our country and in Washington state. So today, today, there was a supplemental budget proposal discussed in the House Appropriations uh, Committee that uh, will do some COVID relief, immediate COVID relief. And they want to get that out the door and, and pass right away just at the state level. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I mean, that's a way better uh, situation than I was expecting when I last talked to you and Elise and, you know, $9 billion, you know, which is just a huge percentage, you know, of... <laughs> It's 40%, uh, you know, 30, 40% of the overall total uh, right there. I mean, that's that would that would have been really significant. And yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I am very concerned about the, you know, the, the the lack of federal relief, particularly for smaller businesses, you know, that have that have closed across the state. And, you know, it it's so it's a lot easier to close a business than it is to start one up. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're if you're a, a small business owner and you're not sure about your health care. Uh, you're not sure about what the market's going to be. You're not sure about how people's economic behavior is going to change. It's going to take a while for people to get up both the, the money and, you know, and kind of recover from the loss of those businesses to start new ones. And so it's been really frustrating, you know, I think for everybody to see that lack of federal response, which has really caused, I think, lasting economic damage to so many folk. Yep. And I, I think that the, the legislature, Republican and Democrat um, together know that there will be a continuation of relief coming uh, from, uh, from Washington, DC. And that I think there is, um, with, with the new leadership in the White House, I think we'll see um, a more coming together of, of the House and the Senate. Uh, there won't be, uh, it, it won't be a kumbaya uh, party by any means. There'll be a lot yeah, sure. of bitter debates about the levels of funding of the various programs. But I think there you will see a commitment, a great commitment that we've got to get something out the door and not sit on it like for six months like we did last year. Thank you so much. So, so in the midst of this, you know, co this, this, you know COVID is still here where the vaccines are starting to roll out, but it's going to take a long time. And I, and I, again, I think from listening to people talk about COVID, I mean, I think we're going to have to be expecting to have vaccines for that every year in the fall or at some point during the year. It will it will have changed behavior to some degree, I, I think, in our economy. But it's going to take a while for us to get back to some kind of new normal, whatever that's going to be. So it, it, as, as you're looking at a two-year budget with the new normal not yet known, which is really a, a challenge for our governor and for our legislators, right? Um, what kind of budget priorities is FAN advocating for right now? Well, I think one of the most important ones, um, Terry, would be uh, the Working Families Tax Credit. So many of the listeners uh, may be aware that at the federal program for decades, we've had a program called the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. Yep. And it's an effort to try and what I was talking about before, the great wealth divide that we have in our country is, is not closing. Uh, it's continuing to increase. And um, so the, the, we several sessions ago, I've been doing this. Now, I, I'm now in my 21st uh, legislative session. I can remember about seven, eight, maybe even ten, it doesn't matter. Several years ago, the Washington State Legislature passed the working families tax credit. Thing is, you got to put money in that bank, and 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 that's never been appropriated. Um, so, and just for the listeners, the, the way the EITC works is is the eligible households, which are in essence lower income households, um, receive a, a monthly cash benefit. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing this as a perfect fit at this point in time to fund this because of, of families in those situations that are particularly, obviously, barely hanging on, if at all. 
So we want to uh, try and fund that. It is going to be a, a big, uh, big lift, but we have some revenue packages, um, a, a tax on wealth, and there's various forms of that. <clears throat> there's the corporate compensation tax. There's the simply just the flat out, not, not a, I don't mean the flat tax, but a, a um, just a tax on household wealth that would start at, it's called the billionaire's tax. So um, uh, there, there's that proposal, that'll be heard next week, um, along with the capital gains, uh, removing that exemption so that capital gains would be taxed. So those are some of the, uh, of the budget priorities. There are other really important um, uh, budget priorities that come in other policy areas that we oftentimes don't think of. Uh, this morning, um, um, you know, we, we're, we're going through two pandemics. We're going through an economic pandemic and uh, a racial justice type of a pandemic. We know that mm -hmm. the, the fight yeah. is the soul for America. But we, um, uh, FAN is a part of, a, of the Washington Coalition on Police Accountability. And I'm, uh, I'm not shifting the conversation at all because, because, fund, uh, because police reform, as difficult as that is, just in and of <laughs> itself, yeah. um, some of those reforms won't happen unless there is funding for it. Yes. And, and, and I think the police, uh, the law enforcement associations in our state, as much as they may not and will, will, will work to uh, not see a particular bill pass the way it, it was introduced, um, because it does create change. They will have, if, it, if it's going to come, if the change is going to come, you got to fund it. Yeah. You got to give us the funding for it. So this morning, um, Representative Entman from uh, Auburn area, one of one of our many uh, now African American legislators in Washington State, we have more than we've ever had in this in this state, um, yeah. would establish a state in, uh, office of independent investigation. Nice. The price tag on that's going to be at least twenty six million, if not. Wow. More. So Over all two I'm years. saying, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, all I'm saying is that there are um, uh, budget priorities that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, cover the, the gamut, right? And the, and the other one that we will be strongly advocating for, and I don't think you'll see uh, much pushback on, on it at all, and that is emergency food assistance. Yeah. And that's how critical this is, right? And that also, so, so, so there's, there's the Working Families Tax Credit, there's police reform that needs to be funded out of, out of the budget. Um, there's just what I mentioned, the emergency food assistance. And then last but not least, is our housing trust fund. It is one of the most important um, uh, good bang for the dollar uh, use of our public dollars, of our tax dollars at the state mm -hmm. level in terms of uh, building and renovating existing housing and building new housing to the housing trust fund. That's, mm -hmm. And that's a $250 million price tag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we had some, some, uh, some apartments developed e even in my, my hometown here uh, with kind of a combination of of uh, t of taxes that come in or fees that come in on on retail on, on a real estate transactions, yep. but I think I think the housing trust fund also contributed to that. And there's a ton, there's a, quite a few folk living in that now, which was an old abandoned building, perfectly sound, but just it just needed some some rehab and some structural um, some structural work done. Um, so th those kind of budget priorities are really you know, really make makes sense to me, especially with wealth and income inequality, as you said, so incredibly, you know, um, really posing a threat to the fabric of our nation. I mean, I, I've, I've I have family members that work in the food industry. And I, I think there's an economic theory that they have, you know, that if you can't make it in America, it's because you're lazy. You know, and uh, and I and I, I just have to say to them, look, um, what do people do when they get more money? They buy food, right? So so a lot. So giving people the helping people to to have enough funds when when they're on that lower end lower end of that scale of that economic in, in, income scale, it, it actually benefits the rest of the community. And there's just so much of this uh, this neoliberal economic policy out there that just says we can't we can't you know help money get redistributed, 
because but the thing that they're not understanding is that work is as i've said before is no longer working to transfer enough money around the around the economy equitably so there's tons of people that are working two or three jobs and do not have enough money and now with covid they can't work those two or three jobs because two of them got two of those businesses closed and so what do we expect people to do and so I'm just really thankful for you, you carrying those values uh, to the legislature, Paul. Yep, yep. No, thanks, Terry. Thank you. So, so we know in this last year, you know, and we've talked about this a little bit, you know, that with the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and in more and so many more, um, we're seeing the need for criminal justice and police reform. And, and I've talked to quite a few police here locally, you know, who, who I, I think, uh, you know, they they don't like it when police behave poorly, yep. right? It makes their job harder. Um, yes. And yet there seems to be uh, a lack of accountability sometimes. I, I get pretty frustrated myself with this, with this idea that we're going to equate black lives with, uh, as they say, blue lives, with as if someone is born into a police uniform. A police uniform is a, is you, you take a, you, training for that, you have a uh, an oath to protect and serve the citizens of that jurisdiction. It is a calling. It is a job. It has responsibilities to it. Um, and and I, for one, don't want to beat up beat up on police at all. But I think you know I'm an executive director of an organization. I should be held accountable for what I do well and what I don't. And so, what what kind of things are you all advocating for right now in terms of? Uh, of a po criminal justice and police reform. Yeah, no, thanks, Terry. Um, uh, again, I, I just want to lift up uh, our partners because FAN uh, uh, does not do this uh, big heavy lifting, obviously, unto itself. So we have many, many partners. And I just want to lift up again the Washington Coalition for Police Accountability, uh, mm -hmm. particularly because um, it's not just made up of, of uh, big liberal social change uh, organizations. It's made up primarily of impacted family members who have lost a family member um, because of, of an encounter with law enforcement, right? Yeah, and sure. so they are really uh, the center and they testified, we had two bills today. I already mentioned one, the independent investigation bill yeah. and uh, they testified on that. That bill is currently now gonna be under negotiation and, and amendments. Um, but a second bill that was introduced today um, and heard was from Representative Tai uh, in Mercer Island. And the reason I re re um, mentioned Representative Tai is just to give people a little bit of flavor of who our, who our legislators are. I mentioned Representative Entman from South King County being one yeah. of nine now, historic numbers of African-Americans in our legislature. But yeah. Representative Milan Tai from Mercer Island is the first refugee uh, serving in our Washington State legislator. Uh, uh, her, her birth country is Vietnam. And uh, she's an amazing woman, has great passion for, for justice, and has introduced House Bill 1202, which was heard today, which would do two things in terms of changing uh, police culture. One is the ability not just to be able to sue, say, Officer Kylo or Officer Benz, but to be able to sue the police department by which you work for. Um, and I know that sounds very punitive, but it's uh, the families and so many in our country and our state see this as leveling um, what they see as, as, a, as a very unlevel um, um, field. And the other thing that would get at is the whole issue of qualified immunity, which we believe has really put up a shield for decades uh, in our country in terms of, of law enforcement. And again, I know for listeners that may have loved ones who are in law enforcement, this is not a, a get back at them type of thing. It's again, to try and level the playing field and to make sure that the community is protected as well and that all officers are held to the same standards. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think the, the obvious you know, situation is the police officers are in challenging situations on a more frequent basis than you or I are. And I think, and I, and I hope that whatever legislation is put forth is going to have a sense of fairness for them and for that reality, right? Um, 
at the same time, um, you know, it seems like the way police unions have functioned across the country, and generally, you know, I think unions are great, there has been this sort of uh, lack of capacity to, uh, to hold individual officers into account and police departments to account for the culture that they create. And so I, 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 I really hope that we can kind of keep that balance. And I know sometimes in, if a police officer makes a mistake, it can be easy for local political leaders to kind of scapegoat them in a way that, that isn't really fair either. You know? And so I, I hope that the legisl legislative work is sort of balancing all these different tensions and realities as it moves forward. Well, just today, in fact, after this bill, after the bill that um, House Bill 1267 on independent investigations, and of course, obviously law enforcement are testifying at, at all of these. And I will say in terms of the level of civility, this is, this, all these bills go through the House Public Safety Committee, most of them, some go through the yeah. Judiciary Committee. But there is, is total earnest by the committee chair and by the prime sponsors to try and, you know, we, we at least wanna to come together and have the conversation to see where, where can amendments be agreed to um, yeah. in terms of the bill that was introduced but also that we all have to agree to disagree. And um, uh, after the bill, uh, we picked up the phone and, and we're in conversation with the Fraternal Order of Police, who is, that is led by, that's a, a state association led by the police chief, uh, James Shrimpshire um, down in Algona. And um, James is, is, and I've found other uh, police leaders uh, to be um, also very transparent in these very, very difficult times because they know uh, things need to change. It's, you know, to what degree and um, that we don't totally um, take away everything, like the, like the defund police uh, effort. So. Yeah, I mean, I just think as, as, as much as I understood, like, the, the policies behind that, I think the messaging around that, I, I didn't find that messaging to be particularly helpful. Um, you know, but I, but I understand the energy behind it. <laughs> and, uh, and I respect that too. Um, exactly. Uh, but I'm not sure that the messaging was, was, was precisely right. Um, always. Um, but I, but I wish people had dug in and learned more about what Black Lives Matter was actually saying because I know in Anacortes here, a group of young people went to the city uh, budget meeting around, the, around the, the, uh, the, the police department here and advocated for more uh, mental health care services uh, for a social worker. And you know they were in a position of saying, you know what, we wanna do that. We're not ready to do it this year. We have to do some studying first, but we will come back to that. And, and I trust that the mayor and the city council um, and, and those young people will actually make that conversation happen uh, a year from now. And I, and I think that kind of democratic process is like so important here. And that's what you all model every day. So we also know, Paul, that there's a lot of weaknesses in our healthcare and in our mental healthcare system. And COVID has certainly increased uh, our awareness of some of those, um, which also have to do with not only access among communities of color, but access for people um, who uh, do not have enough income, uh, really. So what, um, what are you all trying to do at the state, state level in terms of advocating for an expansion of, of our health and mental health care systems? I would uh, lift up two uh, things. One, a very specific um, uh, bill in terms of our health care system, and then a, a larger scale uh, uh, bill the smaller one first, it's basically looking at, at dental care, Terry, and um, it's the dental therapy bill. And of course, again, when you're trying to change an institution, whether it be uh, law enforcement or, or dentistry, um, you know, those that have been, been um, doing dentistry work for decades saying, look, we're, we're, you know, the system is just fine, you know, what, what do you, because basically what this would do in, it could be uh, urban settings as well, but primarily in underserved areas, license uh, uh, a dental therapist type of program so that they could do more than what a dental hygienist does right now mm -hmm. when you go in, uh, I have a dental appointment on Friday. And so um, 
that so it it basically um, adds another layer, a pretty significant layer in terms of our state, in terms of how we license and regulate dental care. Um, and that is a bill that we've been working on for several years. The Children's Alliance, for example, now I'm just trying to list our partners so the audience has an idea who we work with. A uh, great statewide organization, because obviously this is not just affecting uh, adult, the teeth of adults, but our kiddos as well. So, and, and the, another uh, part of our important part of our population, you started in terms of, of honoring uh, our First Nations people is, is, is our tribal communities as well. Um, because oftentimes they are in more remote areas. And what is the dental care like there, especially on the reservations, or for that matter, in terms of uh, urban Indian communities, right? So in, individuals. The larger- well, I mean, one day, one day, Paul, I was talking to my dentist, you know, and. And, uh, you know, he was, he was getting ready to, you know, we're getting to the point where I needed to pull out my wisdom teeth. You know, I just, I've had them for forever, you know, and, and finally it was time, you know, and, and he said, people who do that, who have their wisdom teeth pulled out, don't have any, any nutritional impact. And that struck me, right? Because uh, all of a sudden I realized the very obvious, right? <laughs> for the first time. Oh, like your teeth really impact your capacity to receive nutrition. Yep. Yep. I mean, hello. Right. And, and so, I mean, you know, teeth are not just some kind of vanity thing that you, you know, want to look good for the camera. They're about how human beings stay healthy. Your overall health. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. Uh, the, How the about other on one, the mental health side? Anything on the mental health side, Paul? That um, well, we we are there. There's a whole. I don't know that it's going to pass this year, uh, because it, it is uh, like uh, the the other big health care bill was would be for our undocumented uh, population, which the working families tax credit. I didn't mention that, but that the particular piece in that is for the undocumented community. Um, the Treatment Recovery Act is a big bill. I, I, I think it's gonna get introduced this session because it's gonna have a big price tag, but it would kind of cover, um, well, a lot of it would be prevention, obviously. It, it, so it's tied to the criminal justice system, right? So someone doesn't get put into a county jail or a state prison because they've committed a certain felony because their mental health was not really good. So to try and, and build a system to build on what we've already got, um, be, um, because the system is broken, but we've got a lot of really good pieces, even within that broken system, um, to build on making more treatment available, not just for those in prison, but though, for those who are getting into the criminal justice system to prevent them from, it, it's, it's a way, it's a nexus to reducing the mass incarceration. And uh, so that is called the Treatment Recovery Act. And there are a lot of, again, a lot of great partners uh, working on this uh, from the ACLU on down to uh, a lot of the mental health groups. And um, we, are, we are still pulling, pulling that together and, and we'll be introducing it. But um, we, and, and the other piece in the, in the mental health thing, Terry, that, our, that our, the public is more and more aware of now is, is the homicides that happen in encounters with law enforcement are often so, so many times. So to look at our 911 system, and there are a couple of bills like that. Um, State Representative John Lovick from Somish County, yeah. a long time law enforcement uh, person um, and, and now public servant for many, many years. Uh, and others are looking at that. Uh, Lillian, or Representative Lillian Ortiz Self, one of the, some of the Latinos that are serving our legislative that's worked in the schools for many, many years, um, is looking at that in terms of how the calls get uh, determined by the 911 operator and then sent to law enforcement, right? Can we not send that to a mental health expert or make sure that there is a mental health professional in, in the law enforcement vehicle that's going to a certain crime scene? Well, that, you know, stopping that whole... Um that whole thing of, of a, a person with significant mental illness gets arrested, they're put in the county jail for a day or two, and then they're back on the street. Uh, it just continues to build frustration and anger in them. 
And that's a place where we're really asking police officers to do things that are outside of their skill set, that are outside of my skill set and yours. And, uh, and, and that would, that, I mean, if I, when I talk to police officers, the way, the way that they have to deal with people uh, who do not have adequate mental health support in our state is putting stress on everyone. And I, I'm really thankful, you know, for that. Um, Cause we, we just made some huge mistakes in the 1980s around defunding so much of our mental health care system in this country. And, and, and there's so many people suffering from that. So, you know, talking about income inequality earlier, um, you know, the difference between the cost of housing, we all know what's happening to home, home prices and to rent prices, uh, or at least what will happen to rent prices once, uh, once some of the restrictions are, are taken off are outpacing the median income. And we know that many people are far below the median, right? Um, so what are you hoping the legislature will pass this year to deal with uh, developing more housing and uh, for those who find themselves unhomed right now? Well, uh, a couple of things, Terry. One is uh, in this package that the um, uh, State House Appropriations Committee was uh, looking at today, it's, it's kind of called the supplemental budget. So what that means is that the, uh, I hope I don't get too technical here for the listeners, but the state's fiscal year, the biennium starts July 1, right? right? And then goes two years. Um, so our current 1921, 2019, 2021 biennium ends on June 30th. So we still have, you know, five months or so left in terms of that, that fiscal year, that biennium. So that's mm -hmm. what this supplemental budget is looking at. So it's money that they want to get out the door through the agencies before June 30th, right? And some of this is going to be just at, like at the federal level is going to be uh, for tenants, for renters, but also for landlords because landlords have their own um, mortgages, their own bills as well. Because oftentimes it is like this between the tenants community, renters and, and landlords. Um, um, I'm, I, I'm only on the B squad on that, but let me tell you the the, the A squad lobbyists, uh, the, the Low Income Housing Alliance is another uh, great partner that we have. That's a statewide um, uh, housing alliance advocacy group. Um, often does battle with the landlord association over uh, just you know having a just cause to evict, right? And and all and, and how many days um, do you give notice for that, right? Um, so those battles are taking place um, between the Senate and the House. They, they, they just can, can uh, continue the last few years because bills get passed and then you, you refine it, make it better, right? Uh, make it more just. And the other point that I wanna raise, and you actually referenced this earlier, Terry, in terms of, of um, how there can be, when you talk about partnership, so instead of being like this, where can, and, and there are many in the landlord community that have found ways to be, um, you know, there are some very, very difficult situations. Look, I, I get that. Um, yeah. But what I'm talking about is in terms of the real estate community and what is that nexus, right? In, in our state, many ways appropriately. So we're okay, if we're gonna increase a tax, a fee on this, what is the, the, the normal nexus? Well, I talked earlier about a tax on wealth, whatever wealth that is, whether it's capital gains, uh, compensation. What is then yeah. the nexus? How will that, you're just gonna put that money, if, if it is passed just into the general fund, why not then make it so to, to lower the wealth uh, gap for the working families tax credit? So in terms of housing, the real estate com community, last time I know that um, they oftentimes may say that they're, they're, they're hurting, but compared to those that are unsheltered and in need of shelter and, and, and a home, um, in terms of our working families, uh, we, have a, we have the document recording fee. And that document is the real estate document that gets filed for every real estate transaction at the county level. And it's a yep. split, yeah. so much goes to the state and so much stays in the, at the local level. So we're looking at raising that by a hundred million. Um, it would be the overall goal to, to and um, the uh, a representative from Spokane, that's actually the chair 
of the House Appropriations Committee, so we have a good prime sponsor, um, is, is uh, prime sponsoring that bill, the document recording fee. And, and, and Paul, what would that money be used for specifically? Like, just help us imagine that. Sure, 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 sure. So when it goes to the local level, and it primarily goes to the, it doesn't go to, to the to the federal uh, housing authority, right? They, they have their own revenue sources, but a lot of counties have their own um, housing programs, right? And uh, so it would go for that. It could, the county really decides that uh, in terms of the county commissioners. Um, it could go for, sh uh, sh uh, I live in the city of Everett, we have a huge housing crisis. What is, what's the specifics of that? Well, just generally speaking, we're talking about lack of affordable housing, or again, for working families and uh, our unsheltered community, just in terms of, of, of emergency shelter. So, um, so that, that, it, that share of that money, it's, it's the smaller share. I, I forget, I think it's maybe a 70, 30 uh, split. Say on a dollar 70 cents goes to Olympia, 30 cents goes, but 30 cents multiplied, you know, um, times 100 can, in, in whatever, uh, can increase considerably. So, and then at the state level, it goes to the same thing because our State Department of Commerce that deals with most of our housing programs already gets dollars for the housing trust fund, which does renovation and new buildings. And so a lot of these dollars go either to supplement that or go into uh, transitional housing because that's a whole piece of the, of the whole housing crisis puzzle. And uh, and also our, our sheltered programs, or emergency. Yeah, programs. yeah. So so in Anacortes, uh, in about the year two thousand, I was a, a part of a committee that ended up helping to create the Anacortes Family Shelter. And there were many s sources of funds, and you know we went and spoke with the city council, and then they went and spoke with the with the county, and they they basically told us you got to wait a couple years because there were other projects in the pipeline. But that when that money came along uh, was was kind of our turn in a way. Um, we had developed our plans and gave us time to get together and and even purchase a piece of property, and that really helped. And now that Anacortes Family Center has not only a lot, fifth, a lot of beds for people who who are unsheltered, it has tr it has you know training programs to help people get get connected and and do what they need to do to kind of recover from the experience of being un unsheltered, right? But now they have transitional housing as well. And that money uh, and, and the and sort of the local buy-in from our governmental officials helped us to get other grant money from corporations and from the federal government. And so it kind of became a gateway into enough funds that we were able to actually have a facility with zero mortgage. And that meant that all the dollars coming in could go to maintaining the facility and uh, to providing services. And so those those funds make a lot of difference. Yep, yep. Um, well, those are some great examples, Terry. And and you can just multiply those examples. I I've always said in all, all the years of, of my lobbying, being kind of the quote the church lobbyist in Olympia, because there's not too many reverends that 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 lobby. Um, um, for every project, I don't know about everyone, but you could sit, you know, just in the area of housing, you know, because right, uh, at least in the, in, in the quote old days, you could see a highway construction project and you, you just drive by it. But if you stopped, oh, you know, three, $3.15 million was from blah, 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 that goes to, to, to this bridge or whatever, right? It, what I'm talking about is transparency because that builds trust and somehow, like with the, whether it's an emergency shelter program you were talking about or Housing Hope in Selmish County, which receives, federal, which receives fed, federal and state dollars and local housing dollars, if there could be more of a, a public transparency program that each of those nonprofits would do to say to the public, your tax dollars helped build this or provide this service. Your tax dollars, because, you know, Anyway, you and I know the the the, the dirty three-letter word in in our governmental uh, divide, and that's one of those dirty words is TAX. So, well, and and let's and let's talk about that for a minute. You know, Paul, um, the core of the Abrahamic traditions, and there is more than three, uh, <laughs> but is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
And I think, you know, part of the, the challenge so many folk are having with government in general right now and with, is that it's, it's, it feels very complicated. That's, that's a part of it. It just feels overwhelming. Um, but, but the other part is, I think, a lack of imagination in recognizing that part of the way that we care for our neighbor in a, in a, in a society where there's 330 million people in our country and about 7 million in our state, um, you're not going to be able to outsource all the care for neighbor to churches, mosques, synagogues, and temple. It's just not going to work. And so part of how we care for each other is that. But, but I think I, I, hear, I hear family members sometimes and I hear other people say, well, nobody ever gave me anything. I, I earned everything I got. And of course, that kind of drives, that's a, a failure of imagination, let's just say. Uh, Paul, that's because a way to say it, Jerry. Well, <laughs> so, so, so I'll say, you know, um, well, so you, you didn't get a, a free uh, education primary through high school. Um, there were no public roads or transportation for you. Um, there was no like, like regulation of food. So you didn't have to wonder if your food was poisoned or not. And so I'll just start walking down some of those things and then they'll say, oh, well, there's that. So I don't deny, I say to them, that you've worked hard. Right, right. Like, that's good. Like, like we all should contribute what we can to the larger culture. But I, I think right now there's a growing awareness among some anyway that if we don't address wealth and income inequality, if we don't address uh, you know, some other issues like um, as well, uh, through our tax dollars in responsibility to each other, that society is going to break down in such a way that they're not going to be able to make as much money anymore because they're going to have to pay so much more money for security or whatever else, right? So it's a well, frustrating conversation. If I, um, and I, I can remember thinking about this in one of my first sessions of lobbying, because even then there was great conversation about uh, revenue taxation and, um, and the wealth tax, as I mentioned, that bill will be heard in house finance next week, next Tuesday. If I testify, I don't know that I will um, because that's a process in and of itself. I won't, won't uh, bore you with here, but uh, you can wait for hours and then not get called up to testify. It's like, why did I prepare this sermon for? You know, I, I don't mean sermon, but you know what I mean. Um, that's a but, but, but the phrase that I often, that I use in a press conference years ago in the legislature, I would use in my, if, if I did testify, it's like, and, 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 and everybody, you know, religious or not, knows the phrase, to whom much is given, um, much is required. Yeah. So, but, yeah. uh, and, and, and I, I would say that in state government there has, and, and within the private to use that, to whom much is given, uh, much is required, meaning um, those, those that have uh, a lot, lot of wealth, in our, in our uh, private communities, if I could say that, um, non-public um, yeah. individuals and corporations have stepped up to the plate and, and will be testifying next Tuesday on behalf of this bill to in that's that's endorse what that, that, that phrase. That is, that is great to hear because without a society in which you know, people have a you know, opportunity, I mean, we, all, we also know, and we could talk at some future point about how um, you know, America is like, the United States is like 30th or so in terms of social mobility in the world. Yep. The social mobility of people being able to, to make, you know, to, 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 to rise in income, not that that's the only part of life that's important, right? But it is an important economic measure. Um, we're doing way worse at that than we, than we do and far worse than we imagine, I think, as a country. Um, so, so you know, we've all seen the fires in California. We saw the fires in Oregon. And we saw them in such a way that they were essentially unfightable. They're creating their own weather systems, their own wind. Uh, we got a lot of trees in Western Washington, especially, but across the state. And, um, you know, we, we are seeing, you know, farmers really starting to recognize that, the, that it's not just that the, the weather's changed a little bit, the climate is changing. Um, what are you all doing with respect to um, addressing climate change in your conversations at the state? Well, there, there are several things. And, and again, one of our um, really, and we have a, we have a great um, 
uh, nonprofit environmental community, if I could uh, call it like that, uh, that does great advocacy uh, in Olympia and in Washington, D.C. Um, and one of those is a faith-based interfaith uh, group, you know, Earth Ministry, of course, Terry, yeah. that you're well aware of, um, and probably many of our listeners, too. So I'm not going to cover um, all, all of their alleged agenda, but uh, some of the, the crossover um, between the two of us is uh, a couple of things I just want to lift up is um, the Clean Fuel Standards Bill. You know, how do we, how do we make a cleaner environment uh, by w once again putting a price? Uh, and I, right away you hear that price. Well, that sounds like that three-letter word you were talking about, T-A-X. And, uh, but again, to whom much is given, much is required. So how, speaking of anacortas, you know, the, the, the oil industry and you know, how uh, do you capture those emissions cap and trade? So there's a lot of different versions, um, but um, there will continue to be, that bill will continue to be worked. Uh, it passed the house last year um, wow. after, uh, I, I would, I think, I think five hours, maybe 10 hours. It was one of the longest debates, floor debates. And it just um, kept getting debated, amended, amended, amended. Um, and you know who was at work outside those doors. Um, now, of course, this session is all remote. Um, the other one I wanna lift up is the HEAL Act. This is HEAL Act uh, 2.0. HEAL stands for Healthy Environment for All. So this is looking at how our communities of color in this state are, are impacted uh, by climate change and, and by in industrial pollution. Um, so um, that, is, that is a continuing effort to make sure that all of our state agencies consider environmental justice in terms of the programs that they have, because it's not just in the Department of Ecology um, where, where there's environmental programs. So uh, that's an important bill. And then last but not least, I wanna lift up um, uh, someone that we know in common. This gets back to um, who, who some of the 147 state legislators are. Uh, one of our, our probably, the, I think maybe the only Native American serving in our state legislature right now, Deborah Lakanoff uh, from, from Skagit County, whom you know well. And um, she has, a, uh, a bonding bill. So it's looking at the whole bond financial system, right? And how you can generate money. The states have always used that in our, in our, in our country as, as a way to uh, generate revenue. Uh, but this is called the Washington Strong, Washington Strong Green Recovery Bonds. So they would be the money that would be generated would go into the transition of a fossil fuel economy. And I'm speaking at the 30,000 foot level. There's a lot of specifics to that. But as, as we look at the oil industry, speaking up of Anacortes, or, the, or say more practical, the, the coal industry that is finally being shut down uh, in the state that by, by legislation that was passed years ago, but is taking the, the course to actually get fully implemented. What about those jobs that are lost there? That's right. and, and so to generate the, the revenue for those that are still of the age to learn a, a new uh, vocation to use public dollars to help help that transition. Um, yeah, that, that's great. And of course, as you know, you know, coal is is just so expensive um, so that, that it's no longer really economically viable. I mean, these last four years, we've not seen the recovery of coal anywhere as far as far as I'm aware. And so it's it's about time as as renewables become so much more um, uh, so much cheaper, you know, per kilowatt hour or per per amount of energy. But 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 yeah, it really is important for us to take it to take seriously that those transitional needs. And I think I know in other states, you know, people have like given people an opportunity for a a seven thousand dollar buyout, or they can have free community college, you know, courses or whatever. And Sometimes people take the seven thousand dollar buy up and buy a pickup, and then and then they they're kind of stuck. And so I, I hope this will be structured in a way where we can really assist those households in 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 um, in making that transition. Because I, I think we're nearing a, a place where the jobs are going to start emerging in the green economy 
Um, I, I, and I think some of those skills will transfer. Uh, some of them will. Well, we've got a lot of work to do, don't we, Paul? Oh, my. Yeah, we do. And, you know, <clears throat> in terms of that, um, the work is always made lighter. You know this by you've got a great team where you work at, Terry, right? You, you wouldn't want to do all this production <laughs> uh, by yourself. Um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't look good on, 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 on the set. But um, um, the team, the advocacy team, in Olympia, so there's the those would be maybe the grass tops. The 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 I'm talking about all the lobbyists. Those people like myself that go down from a variety of of, of communities around our state. Uh, it is growing and deepening and broadening. And I want to lift up one example of that. As yeah. you mentioned, a lot of work that's before us, and it's and it's and it's uh, over the the racial justice issue, and the phrase that we've heard a lot and need to continue to remember. Black Lives Matter. So Black Lives Matter, we love acronyms. BLM uh, is very active. I, and I'm, I'm always saying active in Olympia as if it's, but it, it's all remote this session, uh, which is a strange, stranger in, in and of itself. But um, they are, uh, we, uh, I've always worked a lot with the African-American community, as you know. Um, I've worked on their um, uh, lobby day almost as much as I do with fans lobby days. But um, uh, the Washington State BLM, Black Lives Matter, has a lobbyist first time uh, ever uh, in, in Olympia mm -hmm. doing the remote lobbying. And so it, is, it is really refreshing to see that. And believe me, they are, they, they are there to stay. Uh, they're getting funding, which, is, um, which should have happened decades ago. But the point is, and they got great leadership um, in that organization. Well, as, as we continue to struggle, you know, with uh, a, a, an over 400 year legacy of what Isabel Wilkerson calls the caste system based on skin color and, and how that has impacted all of us, but especially how it has impacted in our indigenous neighbors and our, 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 our black and brown skin neighbors. Um, you know, we, we will never be healthy and whole as a country until we grapple with that history and begin to, to do our own personal work, to do our institutional work, to do our structural work, which is in part what, what you're involved with um, as well. And um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue that work. I know it's going to scare some people, yep. you know, and we're certainly seeing some of that, oh, yeah. uh, that, that response, but um I, I think I think more and more. Uh, I think that there are others that are seeing that you know human rights are not a zero sum game. Just because you have rights doesn't mean I don't. We don't have to compete over human rights, and and actually we don't even have to compete over economic capacity either, because we know from studies that when immigrants come into a, a neighborhood, they may take a few low paying jobs at first, but very quickly they begin to contribute to the economic health and the, uh, the cultural health of a neighborhood um, within a very short period of time so that there are in fact more jobs available because they are there. And I think we're often confronted with this kind of, of competitiveness, this sort of uh, scarcity mode and that scarcity mode often portrayed by politicians scares us into opposing each other's rights and economic opportunities to everyone's detriment. And so I just, I'm so thankful that the Black Lives Matter um, community has a representative there to lift up that voice. And I'm grateful that you and, and so many of the rest of us are willing to stand with them and uh, make sure that their voice is heard. That, that, yeah. so, so Paul, thank you for all the work you do. Well, I look forward to more conversations with you and, um, and, and, to, and to all the further stuff we're gonna be doing. Uh, Paths to Understanding is working on some stuff kind of behind the scenes here to, to try to help people who are engaging, who wanna do some kind of interfaith or multi-faith work uh, to be able to find each other and receive some of the training and support. I'll be sharing more about that in the future. Um, until next time, I want everyone to know you can find out more about FAN at fanwa.org. You can find out more about Paths to Understanding at paths2understanding.org. 
And uh, we, our podcast is available on all the major podcasting websites and, and platforms. Uh, the, PAS, the PAS network has, or, excuse me, the PAS podcast has both Challenge 2.0 episodes with Jeff Renner and these Wisdom from Our Neighborhood episodes um, here. And until we see you again, we encourage you to be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you all for watching.